Simpson's Paradox. Simpson's Paradox is often presented as a compelling demonstration of why we need statistics education in our schools. It was first noted by Edward H. Simpson in 1951, who observed that the overall combined data can sometimes mask important insights that became evident when looking at subgroups. This paradox occurs when trends observed in different groups of data reverse upon combining those groups. Assume that there is a new treatment for a disease. You look at two groups, both males and females. Among males, 70% of treated patients survive, while only 30% of untreated patients survive. Among females, 80% of treated patients survive, while only 40% of untreated patients survive. Based on these separate groups, it seems like the treatment is very effective for both males and females. Now let's combine the data. In the combined group of males and females, 50% of treated patients survive, while 60% of untreated patients survive. Surprisingly, when you look at the combined data, it appears that the treatment is less effective or even harmful. This reversal of the trend when the groups are combined is known as Simpson's paradox. The paradox happens because of a third variable, called a confounder, which affects the two groups differently. In this case, the third variable could be something like the severity of the disease, which might vary between males and females, affecting the overall survival rates. To decide whether the treatment is truly effective, you need to look at the data carefully, considering the impact of the third variable. In some cases, the combined data gives the right conclusion, and in others, the separate groups give the correct answer. The Monty Hull Problem you're on a game show and there are three doors. Behind one door is your dream car, and behind the other two are goats. You pick a door, let's say door A, then the host, Monty Hall, who knows exactly what's behind each door, opens another door, say door B, revealing a goat. Now, he gives you a choice, stick with your original choice, door A, or switch to the remaining unopened door, door C. Intuitively, it might seem like it doesn't matter if you switch or not, because there are two doors left, so the chances should be 50-50. But surprisingly, if you switch doors, you actually have a higher chance of two-thirds winning the car compared to your initial choice of one-third. The key insight is that Monty's action of revealing a goat provides new information that changes the underlying probabilities. Initially, each door has a one-third chance of hiding the car. After Monty opens a door with a goat, the door you initially pick still has a one-third chance, but the combined probability for the other two doors, since Monty won't reveal the car, becomes two-thirds. Therefore, switching to the other door increases your chances of winning to two-thirds. Now if there are 100 doors, behind one is a new game console, behind the other goats, you pick door 1. Monty opens 98 other doors, all goats. Now you have door 1 and door 73 left, should you stick or switch? Switching to door 73 now gives you a 99% chance of winning, because Monty's actions shows where the goats are, making door 73 very likely to have the console. The Sleeping Beauty Problem Sleeping Beauty agrees to participate in an experiment. On Sunday, she is given a sleeping pill and falls asleep. During the experiment, a coin is tossed secretly. If it lands on heads, she's woken up on Monday, given another sleeping pill, and then woken up again on Wednesday. If it lands on tails, she's woken up on both Monday and Tuesday, each time given a sleeping pill, and then woken up again on Wednesday. Importantly, each time she wakes up, she doesn't know if it is Monday or Tuesday, and she doesn't know the outcome of the coin toss. Put yourself in the position of Sleeping Beauty. You wake up, you don't know what day it is, and you don't know if you have been woken up before. You only know the theoretical course of the experiment. Now the question is, what is the probability that the coin toss landed heads when she is asked about it after each waking? One camp argues it should be one half, 50%, because at the start of the experiment, whether it's heads or tails is equally likely, regardless of the day she wakes up. The other camp argues it should be one third, about 33.3%, because there are three scenarios. Heads on Monday, tails on Monday, and tails on Tuesday. Since tail scenarios happen twice as often as head scenarios, once for Monday and once for Tuesday, the probability should be one thirds. Imagine repeating the experiment many times. In the long run, Sleeping Beauty would wake up after heads roughly one third of the time, and after tails on Monday or Tuesday, each roughly one third of the time, and two thirds total for tails. This long run experiment should apply to the single trial as well, suggesting one thirds for heads. The Sleeping Beauty problem is a famous thought experiment with no universally agreed upon answer. 
But unlike Sleeping Beauty, if you want to remember what you learned from this or any other video, use studygeniuspro.com to quiz yourself. I've added a quiz for this video in the description. If you enjoy the content, please take the quiz at the end to check your memory. You can create and play multiplayer quizzes from any text, article, or YouTube video. The quality is actually very good and it makes learning way easier and fun. Give it a try guys and thank you to studygeniuspro.com for sponsoring this video. Cantor's Paradox Imagine you have a set A that contains smaller subsets. These subsets could be any groups within A, like different categories of animals in a zoo or types of books in a library. Cantor showed that the number of these subsets, let's call it P of A, the power set of A, is always greater than the number of elements in A itself. This means if A has, say, three elements, its power set, P of A, will have more than three subsets. This discovery was surprising because intuitively we might think that the whole set A should have the most things since it contains everything. But Cantor demonstrates that in terms of numbers, cardinality, the collection of subsets can be larger. Here is the mathematical explanation. In mathematical terms, Cantor's theorem states that for any set A, the cardinality, which measures the size or number of elements of its power set P of A, is strictly greater than the cardinality of A itself. Formally, if the size of A denotes the cardinality of A, then the size of A is less than the size of the power set of A. Here's why this is true. The power set P of A is a set of all subsets of A. To show that the size of A is less than the size of the power set of A, Cantor used a diagonal argument which proves that there cannot be a bijection, a one-to-one -one correspondence, between A and P of A. In simpler terms, even though A might have a certain number of elements, its power set P of A includes every possible way to group these elements into subsets. This results in P of A having more subsets than there are individual elements in A. This mathematical insight was groundbreaking because it revealed that there are different levels or sizes of infinity, challenging our intuitive understanding of size and countability in mathematics. The ant on a stretching rope problem. Imagine an ant standing at one end of a rubber rope that's initially one kilometer long. The ant crawls at a steady pace of one centimeter per second. However, every second the rope stretches uniformly. After the first second, it's two kilometers long. After the second second, it is 3 kilometers long, and so on. The question is whether the ant will ever reach the far end of this rope. Surprisingly, the answer is yes, and here's why. Initially, the ant moves forward 1 centimeter, which is 1 100,000th of the original 1 kilometer length. After the first second, when the rope stretches to 2 kilometers, the ant moves another centimeter, and now this centimeter is 1 200,000th of the new 2 kilometer length. If you sum up all these fractions over time, it forms a series. This series is known as the harmonic series, and it actually diverges into infinity. This means that no matter how large the rope stretches each second, the sums of these fractions will eventually exceed 1, ensuring that the ant will reach the end of the rope. Berry Paradox Barry's paradox is how we define numbers with very specific rules. Imagine trying to define a number using a description that states it cannot be described in fewer than 23 syllables. The catch is that the phrase itself has only 20 syllables. This creates a contradiction because a number it defines supposedly requires more syllables to describe than the phrase itself. Barry's paradox extends beyond mere wordplay. It has implications in fields like algorithmic information theory. Specifically, it suggests limits on the ability to compute the Kolmogorov complexity of a string in general. Kolmogorov complexity measures the shortest computer program or description that can produce a given string. But Barry's paradox hints at cases where such descriptions might become self-contradictory or impossible to construct. Thus, it highlights deeper issues in defining and computing complex entities based on their descriptions or definitions. Absent-minded driver. An absent-minded driver who starts at a point called start on a map. From there, they encounter an intersection called X. At X, the driver can either exit and end up at location A with a payoff of 0, or they can continue to another intersection called Y. At Y, the driver faces another decision. Exit to get to location B with a payoff of 4, or continue to another location C with a payoff of 1. The twist is, is that the driver cannot tell the difference between intersections X and Y, and can't remember if they've already passed one of them before. This lack of distinction makes the decision-making process quite complex. At the starting point, start, the problem seems straightforward. If the driver chooses to continue with a probability p at each intersection, the expected payoff can be calculated 
It turns out that the optimal strategy P here is two-thirds. However, the paradox arises when considering what happens when the driver reaches an intersection, say X or Y. At that moment, the driver should consider the probability A that they are at X, and thus 1 minus A that they are at Y. The optimal decision P to continue then changes compared to the optimal decision at start. This inconsistency challenges the initial optimal strategy found at start. Hooper's Paradox Hooper's Paradox is a fascinating puzzle that plays a trick on our perception of area. Imagine you have a geometric shape with a total of 32 square units. This could be any shape, but for simplicity, let's say it's a combination of triangles and other shapes that together make up this area. You carefully cut this shape into four smaller pieces. These pieces are specifically designed to fit together in a new way. Now you take these four pieces and rearrange them to form a rectangle. When you look at this new rectangle, it seems to cover only 30 square units instead of the original 32. It looks like two square units have disappeared. Here's a trick to understanding the illusion. To understand where those two squares went, we need to look closer at the pieces original triangles and the original shape, there are right angled triangles. One of the sides of these triangles, the shorter side at the right angle, is exactly two units long. Reassemble triangles. When you inspect the triangles in the new rectangle, you notice that the same side is now only 1.8 units long. The slight difference in the side lengths mean that the pieces don't fit perfectly together in the new rectangle. Instead, they overlap a little bit when arranged into the rectangle shape. The overlapping area is a small parallelogram, a shape similar to a slanted rectangle. To find out exactly how much area is overlapping, you can use mathematical formulas. Specifically, you can use the Pythagorean theorem and the Heron's formula. The Pythagorean theorem is to find the lengths of the sides and diagonals of the overlapping parallelogram. And for the Heron's formula, it is to calculate the area of the parallelogram, and Heron's formula allows you to find the area of a triangle when you know the lengths of its sides. When you do the math, you find that the area of this overlapping parallelogram is exactly two square units. This explains the missing area. The original shape, 32 square units, the new rectangle without overlapping, 30 square units, and the overlapping area has two square units. So the two square units haven't disappeared, they are just hidden in the overlap. This clever arrangement creates an optical illusion that makes it seem like the area has vanished. Bertrand's Paradox the Bertrand Paradox is a problem in probability theory that shows how the way we define randomness can affect the outcome. Joseph Bertrand introduced this problem in 1889 to highlight that probabilities might not be clear if the method of choosing a random variable isn't well defined. Imagine you have a circle with an equilateral triangle in it. Now if you randomly pick a chord, a line connecting the two points of a circle, what is the chance that the chord is longer than the side of the triangle? Bertrand came up with three ways to randomly pick a chord in a circle, and each way has a different chance of getting a chord that's longer than a side of an equilateral triangle inside the circle. First, in the random endpoints method, you pick two random points on the circle and draw a line between them to make a chord. If you rotate the triangle so that one of its corners touches one endpoint of the chord, the chord will be longer than a side of the triangle if the other endpoint falls within a certain one-third arc of the circle. The chance of this happening is about one-third or 33%. Second, in the random radius method, you start by choosing a random line from the center of the circle out to its edge, this line is called a radius, then you pick a random point along this line and draw a chord that's perpendicular to the radius and goes through that point. The chord will be longer than a side of the triangle if the point you pick is closer to the center of the circle than where the triangle's side touches the radius. The probability of this happening is 1 half, or of course 50%. Lastly, in the random midpoint method, you choose a random spot inside the circle and use that spot as a middle point of the chord. The chord will be longer than a side of the triangle if the point you picked is within a smaller circle that's half the size of the original circle. The chance of this happening is 1 4th or 25%. These different methods of picking chords each give a different answer to the same question. This shows that the definition of randomness affects the probability result, highlighting the importance of clearly defining how randomness is generated in probability problems.